We are proud to present one of our own Montgomery Amateur Radio Club members, Tom W3TDH, who will talk to us about the history of telegraph and codes. Uh, but first, a little bit about Tom. In addition to working as an electrician and remote site communication technician for many years, Tom has made a career out of helping other people. He started in the eighth grade as an air raid warden and has worked for several fire departments for a total of 44 years in the fire and medical uh, rescue service. Tom also serves on the board of directors for our club and has been our club field day safety officer for many years. He is also the ARES emergency coordinator for Montgomery County and the vice president of the Montgomery County Auxiliary Communications Service. So thank you, Tom, for all you have done and continue to do for amateur radio and especially for our club. So now, Tom, it's over to you. Turn on screen sharing so you can see the slides. Great. So that the uh, basic implements you need for telegraphy uh, are the key. Uh, in the early days, it was a register. Uh, the first receiving instrument was a register. This is a much later example. The early registers, I'll, I have a picture for you later. Um, because, because it uh, controlled the register, the signal through its coils uh, caused the register to operate uh, two of the contacts you see on the near side of the key as a switch. And that switch would apply the local battery to the register and cause it to activate. And when that was off, then the coil would re relax its field and the armature, which is the thing at the end of the spring, right about there, um, was, would fall back towards the other uh, screw adjustment. Now the other screw adjustment has an ivory head. So in the fallback position, there's no conducting going on. Now this came in later. What the telegraphers themselves discovered was that they could copy the telegraph code by the sound of their uh, relays. The relay operating to operate the register uh, was by and large readily audible. And they found themselves uh, able to copy the code without looking at the paper tape that was going through the register. Uh, the company, the Morse Printing Telegraph Company, though, initially forbid that because they were afraid it would endanger their, their patents. Uh, but they discovered later, later that that was not true, and we'll get to that in a moment. So this is a local sounder, a later development of a local sounder, and the reason it's got four contacts on the left end is it's devised to be used at two different voltages, a main office voltage and a local office voltage. So that's why it has four terminals that can be arranged in two different configurations. Now, the basic element of telegraphy is an electromagnet. When you pass current through the coils of an electromagnet, a magnetic field stands up and pulls in the item at F, which is the armature. Um, and that closes a contact that comes out to, as I said before, contacts on the side of the base. Uh, it's very rare, I haven't seen one, but I'm told some exist, for the relays to have controlled contacts at the end of the base. Almost nobody did it. This is Vale's Morse Printing Telegraph Company code. And uh, Morse code, to be honest about it, was never used. Now, Morse's code that Morse devised was a four-digit number applied to every word in common usage in the English language. If you can picture trying to apply that, you'd get a four-digit number and you'd either already know it or you'd look it up in a directory about the size as an old-fashioned telephone book, you know, three or four inches thick, finely printed. Uh, but what Vale did instead is he went up to a newspaper office. He was working in New Jersey at the time. Uh, for reasons that are not clear. And he asked the people setting up the type for the next edition if he could use the backup tray uh, for an experiment of his own. And they sort of put up with it and said, sure. So he counted all the pieces of type that were ready in the backup tray and applied 
the simplest characters to the most numerous pieces of type. And that turned out to be, as you can see here, the E. And it worked out from there so that tray uh, compartments had the least uh, type pieces in them, got the more complicated signals. And you can readily see what those are. Um, the, the numbers um, were not in a, a straightforward pattern, as you can see, it was rather odd. Um, so, but this was the, the Morse printing telegraph company code that Alfred Vail devised. Uh, and when Morse caught up with Vail in New Jersey and found what he'd done, of course, Vail had to report to him and uh, Morse saw how much more efficient and therefore profitable this was going to be and came depressed and took to his bed for six days because he didn't like being trumped by uh, a staff person. There's a picture of Morse, maybe a self-portrait. Morse was a very talented portrait painter and uh, had a good career in that, but due to a conversation he had with some scientific people on a uh, steamship returning to the United States, he uh, was able to see the future in telegraphy. And I'll give him all the credit in the world for having developed the idea for organizing the idea, for putting together the means, for selling the idea to Congress to get a grant, uh, and for organizing the whole thing. Uh, that's what he did, and he deserves a lot of credit for that. He devised the system of telegraphy, uh, but he was a little stingy about sharing credit with the people who devised the instruments and things like that. This is the, the fellow he uh, pirated ideas from so readily. This is Alfred Vail his engineering assistant. Vail's uh, Vail correspondent telegraph key is on display at the Smithsonian Institution um, and was very popular in the early days of telegraphy. Uh, but later on, the uh, simplicity of its spring made it harder to adjust it. So uh, it was later changed. You could adjust the spacing on this, uh, obviously, and that sort of thing, but you couldn't adjust the spring tension. So that wasn't convenient uh, to the operators and better keys were later devised. But this was the first right here. Now this is what's called a leg key. Up until about 1920, all keys were leg keys. And that's because of these two machine screws that protrude from the bottom of the key base and go through the desk on which the key was mounted. The Western Union Telegraph Company as one example, and uh, the uh, Postal Telegraph Company followed suit with a different number, had an exact specification for where on the desk this was to be mounted. And operators couldn't move it because it was fastened down. But the bolts also serve as the terminals for the wires of the telegraph circuit. Uh, so there are no terminals needed on the upper part of the base, as you can see here. They're not necessary and the wire stayed under the desk where it wouldn't be a nuisance or an obstruction to other activities of the operators. Now this is one of the oldest registers and as you can see, it's quite complex. And notice this little hole here in the base, that's where the tape would fall down out of the base and uh, be laid out in trays. Um, if you've ever seen a delivered telegram, you'll often, on most of them see that tapes are fastened to the blank, usually with glue, but sometimes otherwise. And that's because they would take the tape directly from the register and cut it up in a word lengths and fasten it to the blank for delivery, because that was your assurance that it was being delivered to you exactly as it had been sent, printed right off the telegraph line. Uh, very valuable to bankers and people like that. It revolutionized commerce in the entire country. This is the relay. This is the device that was the heart and soul of the whole system. Again, this was devised by Alfred Vail. It takes the signal through these terminals at the back of the base and controls these three terminals uh, at the side of the base. In the, in the course of normal operations, only two of the terminals would be used. Um, the third terminal would basically be unused except for special applications that we won't get into tonight. 
Now there's the parts of a relay. You can see the line terminals over here, the electric, electromagnetic coils, the conductive front contact screw, uh, and the ivory tipped rear gap adjustment screw right there. The spring that would pull the armature, that's this thing here, back against the ivory tip whenever the, the uh, magnetic field was absent. And very important, the adjusting line for the tension of the spring, because as the weather changed, telegraphy could become rather difficult. Uh, the problem was a thing that they called current escape. That was the term of art of their day. And basically it's a ground loss where the current escapes the circuit and returns to the earth. And that, that was a technology problem. They didn't have insulators, both in materials and design that were robust enough to prevent current leaking from the surface uh, of the insulator and into poles and so forth. And that was especially in bad in, in wet or icy weather uh, because it would tend to bridge over the ridges of an insulator and cause the current loss. Now this is a local circuit and this is very important. This local circuit is what saved the uh, Morse printing telegraph company when others tried to steal their thunder and start using this stuff without paying them the royalties they were due on the patent. Uh, Morse and several of his principals, the investors believed that the patent would protect them because of the printing nature of the register which was also in the patent. But when the battle got into court, what saved them was the local circuit because this was unique. Nobody had ever done it before. Here's your relay. As I said before, the signal coming in off the outside telephone line, telegraph line, I'm sorry, is pegged into the various contacts down the side of the uh, pegboard switchboard. And as a result, the current runs through the key through the relays electromagnet and back out to the other direction of the line. And when the relays contacts open and close these two contacts here, that connects this local battery to the sounder in this illustration. Initially it was a register, but later they uh, realized that register wasn't key to either their patents or effective operations when they discovered that the operators could uh, read more quickly using the sounder and that the register was just a side issue on their patents, then they were ready to drop it in favor of the quicker means. Now, initially, there were two people receiving telegraph code. There was a telegrapher and there was a stenographer. The telegrapher would read the tape by looking at, and this is where we get these two terms, the dots and dashes on the paper tape. Uh, most of them were just impressions on the tape. There was no inking involved because that was simpler. And pronounced the letter for the stenographer. And the stenographer would get the message down on paper for delivery or forwarding or whatever they had to do with it. So it took two people to copy each message. But once the uh, telegraphers got to where they could hear the message and didn't have to look at the tape, they were able to copy without assistance and naturally, all the telegraph operating companies quickly did away with their stenographers because labor then is now is a major component of cost. And when you cut cost, if you do it intelligently, you can raise profitability. Now, this is a local battery. It's called a gravity battery. Uh, this is a zinc uh, electrode up here. And it's called the crow's foot because of its shape. And this is a copper plate electrode down here. And this insulated wire coming in at the left of the picture goes down to the, the uh, copper array down here. And this zinc uh, electrode is in the same solution, but what makes the whole thing work is gravity, which is why it was called a gravity battery. The, one of the solutions was had a higher specific gravity than the other. And so they separated themselves without any intervention at all into their two distinct layers. And the uh, only weakness that has that the battery had, if you well, a couple really, but one of the principal things about the battery that some people wished could be changed was 
it needed to be discharging continuously. And you needed to re renew the chemicals at a period of something like two weeks to a month. Uh, and that would depend on such factors as how warm the office was. If you were up in the Great Northern Railway in Canada, uh, you'd have to end up renewing more because the battery got very sluggish at cold temperatures. Now, this is a common sounder. The terminals at the back of the base there are where the telegraph lines. Uh, the telegraph line that is inside the office, and this can be a little confusing, is called the inside loop. But it's an inside loop of the outside line. It's a loop of wire that comes off the two directions of the outside line and passes through the office and is picked up on mainline sounders and relays so that it can be worked by telegraphers. Um, here's several views of the parts of a sounder. Notice this label here. This is a local sounder uh, because four ohms and one volt give you 250 uh, milliampers or a quarter of an amper of current. Um, and uh, main line equipment like the relay runs on less than a tenth of an amper. Uh, and therefore can function even when there's current leakage and the line current goes rather low. And the superior adjustability of the relay was made that what made that continue even under bad conditions. Uh, but you can see the armature here, uh, which was generally aluminum, at least in, in later years. And then there's a gap adjusting screw here and a strike adjusting screw here. And he, here's the tension adjusting screw which when the weather got flaky, you'd have to change so that the tension wouldn't defeat the signal uh, because it was too weak. Um, so there's, there's a pretty good view of both your electromagnetic coils. And in receiving for the entire history of telegraphy uh, in the US, this was the principal instrument used to receive. Now this is a resonator and they took several forms, but the basic idea of a resonator is a lot like our beam antennas in amateur radio. They take all of the sound available and concentrate it and reflect it in a single direction. And by aiming the resonator, the telegrapher could get the clearest sound and the loudest sound out of the sounder that could be had. But as I said, these took many forms. This is an ACME a register. And here you can see one of the tricks that telegraphers use. This is a tobacco can from Prince Albert Tobacco, uh, Queen Victoria's true love that died of uh, um, dysentery, Buckingham Palace. Um, and here is a candlestick resonator, still the Acme design, by the way, you can see it there. The triangle design is called the Acme. And here's an Acme resonator on a swing arm. And what was very handy about this is by manipulating these arms in various folds and directions, the telegrapher could have that right by their ear if they needed to. And of course, there's no sounder in this space. I just wanted to illustrate the Acme resonator, resonator on a swing arm as a separate thing. So I found this uh, photograph. But with this right near your ear plus a tobacco can propped in with it because the tinny sound was an effective mechanical amplifier for the clicking of the uh, sounder. Uh, they could hear pretty well. Keep in mind that a lot of these were in railway stations and in the railway stations of the early telegraph era, uh, there was not a more noisy place in town. Steam locomotives are just horrendously noisy. Uh, the tracks were not as smooth as they are today. They were butted. They weren't welded to each other. Uh, so they were very noisy when uh, rolling stock was in motion. Plus, there'd be freight handlers, people vying for the agent's attention to either send a telegraph or obtain a ticket or a time schedule. It was a pretty frantic place to work. This is a picture of a telegraph office operated by Western Union. And you can see that the telegraphers were all down one side of a set of desks. But I want you to notice especially how young a person could be and have a full-time job. That young man can't be more than 16 if he's a day. 
and yet he had a full-time job with Western Union because he developed the necessary speed and accuracy to handle telegraphy. And uh, as long as he could do that, he was valuable and they'd hire him. Uh, telegraphers were paid not by the hour and not by their age or any other factor. They were paid by the word. The word received or the word sent was what governed the telegraphers pay. Now this is a closed circuit telegraph line and that is the type that was used in the United States. Uh, and as I said, I'm not gonna try and get into the European, which was different. Um, and why it's called closed circuit is the batteries at the two ends of the line uh, were arrays of the cell I showed you earlier, um, gravity cells. Each cell would give you one volt, but if a line needed 100 volts, you had 100 uh, of those cells in series. Uh, and you might have four across in parallel, depending on how much load was on that office, so they could deliver enough current at the voltage they wanted to serve all their needs. And here's how a line worked out. Uh, of various stations along a telegraph line. And as you can see at the poles at telegraph lines that weren't the end of the line, the wire was broken at the pole nearest the station and came into the station and its inside loop was taken through uh, a uh, uh, pin and disc switchboard to direct it to the proper desk. And on the proper Yes, there would be uh, one to three mainline sounders. The function of a mainline sounder is to allow the operator to heal, hear his or her, yes, there were women telegraphers, uh, station's call sign. And once they heard that, they would use, initially they used a, a peg and disc switchboard, but later they used a cordless jack box to divert the line where they'd heard their call sign to the local loop on their desk by connecting it to the relay. These are some of the various kinds of insulators that were used. They were made by quite a few glass companies. Uh, they were competitors and they made their claims, but with organizations like Western Union, uh, they would buy a thousand and put them on a line and see how they compared with another line over the same route that had the old insulators on it. And if they didn't produce better results, they didn't get bought. Uh, but the next insulator is very unique. This is called a white flint insulator, as you can see from the caption. And its claim to fame was that it could take a 32 caliber pistol ball at nearly point blank range and not shatter. And that was important because once these poles went up, uh, large birds saw them as fine roosting places to stand on the cross arm and look for prey below or set up nest. Line maintenance people spend an awful lot of time dislodging large nests from poles. And, and some of the birds were stubborn enough to reattempt it two or three times before the, they'd give up because the line maintainer would come through and knock their nest out of there again. And the problem was it would exacerbate the current escape problem by making contact with insulators and lines. But if you've got a large bird sitting up on the cross arm and here comes farmer Tom Horn and he likes to look at that turkey and he wants it for dinner, what does he do? He opens up the, on the bird with a shotgun and shatters most of the insulators on the cross arm in the process, thus causing ground faults across the entire set of circuits because the insulators are no longer intact. And that was a huge problem throughout the life of the telegraph was people uh, for, uh, you know, survival reasons, uh, necessity reasons, and some from just uh, being a nuisance. Uh, young boys especially like to see, see if, how many insulators they could break with stones. Uh, but you better not be seen because the telegraph company offered a very large reward if you were caught breaking their insulators. And they didn't care what age you were, they were going to make you as miserable as they could. Now, remember I told you the line would break at a pole near the station, nearest the station, and this is called a break arm. Normally the insulator would be right here on that cross arm, 
and it would just wrap around a cross arm and go. But at a station, you had to have a brake iron and two insulators. The one from this direction would be on this insulator. The line from that direction over here would be on this insulator. And they would have a line drop, which the, the wires, if they come from a pole to your house, are still called the drop today. Uh, a lot of our terminology was taken from telegraphy. Uh, and they drop into the station as a local, as a, I'm sorry, as an inside loop, a loop that went inside the station and come back to the other insulator to continue their journey down or up the line. And lines were usually labeled by their compass direction, north and south, east and west. A few stations got more elaborate about it, but not many. Now this is a wall bracket when the line the drop line got down to the station wall, it would come into one of these and end up going through one of these. And these just vary, uh, they're porcelain tubes. They were later uh, used in the first uh, residential wiring to keep uh, electric lines out of contact with the interior wood members of a home uh, for what was called knob and tube wiring. But this was their first use to take the telegraph line inside without wetting going through, the, the tube would be tilted downward towards the outside so water wouldn't flow through it uh, and would often be packed with wax around the wire. Um, and these turned out being fairly effective uh, because the overhang of the stations and railway offices did not allow them to be thoroughly wetted. Now this is a lightning arrestor, nothing like most lightning arresters you've ever seen. And you see these teeth here. A simple railway office that had only one line serving it, especially a rural one that wasn't part of some major route over which a lot of traffic was being carried would use one of these. The larger terminal screws would anchor the inside loop and the inside loop would then go through the smaller terminals to the telegrapher's desk where it would be tied into the relay, which would control the local loop. The ground and the associated ground plate underground in front of the station would be connected to this loop, to this terminal here. Now, if you notice this pin here, that's not normally there because if it was, it would shunt the local loop back to itself and nothing would happen inside the station. You can barely see the normal hole it would sit in when people were in operation because it, in that hole, it was just attached to a single plate and couldn't connect the lines to anything. They'd be connected by the inside loop to the local loop at the relay. There's a couple of other examples of lightning arresters. This was the first adjustable kind because the uh, button plate could be screwed in and out to adjust the gap between the buttons and the bars in behind them. One of the many duties of telegraph operators and especially telegraph candidates was to keep these buff bright because uh, the copper oxide, the corrosion that forms on copper, very poor conductor. So if you didn't keep these free of copper oxide, they didn't function very well. And that, so that you know, is very true of all exposed copper, including the lightning arresters you may have at your station. The uh, reason that most keys will come with another metal on their contacts, even though the key's body will be brassed, is because things like silver do not corrode readily. Uh, so silver-faced contacts would stand up to use a lot longer. This is a single line switch port and arrestor. The arrestor is here, um, and the distance between the arrestor plate and the line plates is what governed uh, what the line voltage had to be before it fired. These two terminals are for the inside loop coming directly from the poles, and these three terminals, uh, this one was your ground terminal because it connected the plate to ground. And these two would be your inside loop terminals. And what decided what was connecting to what were these pins that could be connected to the, 
this disc and therefore this plate, or like this one is to this disc and that plate. Okay. And the other thing that could be done is to put two of the pins, both of them actually here, uh, but there's a pin missing from this board. There should be two over here if there's only one in use. And the reason you had an extra pin was so that you could connect the shunt without breaking the circuit. Breaking the circuit needlessly, since it was a constant on circuit, uh, caused uh, alarm to people up and down the line, and the uh, wire boss would get upset with a telegrapher who did it too many times, and they'd have a difficult conversation. And if it occurred too many times, then he'd get the boot. They'd send him out because you didn't break that line as long as the line was broken and nobody could signal on it. And this again is another line layout. And you can see that the key and the relays electromagnetic coil right here are in the inside loop. The local loop is caused by the terminals off the relays mechanism, which aren't shown here. And this is line trouble, a simple example. The batteries are at both ends, and somewhere between a couple of stations, they have a break in the line. Okay, a tree came down through it in a storm, whatever the reason was. Uh, during the Civil War, it was very common to have a break in the line because your opposition's cavalry, at every chance, would destroy your telegraph lines to hamper your communications. Um, and there were a bunch of other things that went along with that, but are outside the scope of tonight's presentation. So those are the, the uh, devices that made up early telegraphy. And you've seen a glimpse of the code that made up early telegraphy in the United States. Uh, in the United States on the Western Rivers and the Great Lakes, the Morse Printing Telegraph Company code, the one devised by Alfred Vail, was used even from ship to shore because it's what the telegraphers of the nation were used to. Uh, during World War I, Western Union organized and sent lots of telegraphers to the war in France uh, in order to keep communications among American troops. And the French and allied telegraphers were dazzled by the higher speed of the American code. The American code wasn't simple, uh, was rather complex, hard to learn and hard to do well. But those who could do well with it were five to 10% faster than the other codes in use. So the French were quite dazzled by the speed of the American operators, but that couldn't overcome two shortcomings of the American code. One is it was devised solely and only for English. It had no way to express non-English characters. And when you're trying to use it in Europe, in the continent and on the continent, well, there are other characters in things like Greek, and Swedish and Norwegian and so forth that you have to be able to produce. The Continental Code had those other characters incorporated to it when the uh, German railway engineer who devised the demanding gets um, made it up. And when Morris traveled to the continent to see what they were doing with, with his invention, he came back a big enthusiast of Continental Code but the operating officers of the various telegraph companies in the early days there were several uh, ranging from big monolithic things like western union and postal telegraph down to lines that served only a few towns or a few industries um, so this is the point where i can take questions from operations it would be helpful if you would raise your hand by going down to the uh, um, course a uh, place where it says uh, reactions and you'll see a raise your hand icon there that you can click on it will move your image to the top of the uh, images and will show a, a raised hand in the image so that it's easy to determine who's asking questions and in what order go ahead dave I assume that's me. It's a couple of days. Uh, yes, how far apart would the uh, battery stations have to be if you were going transcontinental? Yeah. They, had, 
they they had to be uh, in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred miles apart. And although it wasn't devised as early as my presentation covers, uh, a later development was the development of a repeating setup, a mechanical repeater that would respond to a signal on one side and reproduce it on the other. And at the height of its development, it could receive two signals on each side and transmit them again on the other side of the setup out on two different lines because uh, people like Edison and other pretty uh, ingenious inventors had developed uh, quadruplex tele telegraphy where two uh, conversations could be going in each direction. But that's you know a little beyond the scope of this particular presentation. All right, so I've stopped screen sharing. And, uh, yeah, I have a comment. Yes, David, go ahead. Uh, it's not a question, it's more of a demonstration. So when I did the electronics workshop for the Bullis Summer Program, uh, I had the kids wind uh, relays, not relays, uh, electromagnets, and they had a ball picking up washers and paper clips. But then for $20, I bought the biggest uh, air conditioning relay the 20 amp relay, and I can run it on uh, 12 volts. And for five dollars, you can go to Davidis cigar shop and rummage through their pile of resonant, really resonant wooden boxes with a sliding top. So I would go and tap them all, and then I would put the relay on the box, and then you can tune it for the loudest sound. And let me tell you, it was pretty loud. So the kids enjoyed that, you know, so, and that's cheaper than having an actual sounder that you have to buy for how much, $10,000 from some museum that goes, it would sell. Oh, no, no, the actual sounders of that age still are selling for under 500. Oh. Uh, and some of them as little as 250. And the later sounders are becoming a drug on the market because telegraphy is no longer in use and the interest isn't there among most people, so. Uh, they're going for songs, literally. Um, so, anywho, is there anybody else with a question or a comment on all of that? Well, occasionally I'll call on some of you to help at a uh, STEM night or a STEAM night, as some of the teachers prefer to have them. They include arts in there because the arts people feel left out. Um, but, um, when we go to a STEM night, you have to be prepared. We get dirty looks from some of the other presenters, and here's why. We'll have a register at one of our three stations, and the kids that came to STEM night love being able to type out their name and walk out of there with their name on a printed registered tape, which the telegrapher will mark with the letters of their name for them before they go. And it causes a line at our stations that the other presenters feel a little bad about because we've got the line and they don't. <laughs> and some have even said that telegraphy is inappropriate for a STEM night. And, and I've turned to them and said, everything we do today in electronics is based on digital communication and they only have two conditions, it's on or it's off. So it's the basis of everything we do in digital communications today. It was the first digital mode of communications and it is very appropriate to STEM uh, presentations. So get off my ear. <laughs> I'm usually a lot more polite about it than that. So I, say, I have a question. Yeah. Yes, David. How do you send Morse code with a tin can for in, within prisons? There's no dots and dashes, a long and a short, like in radio telegraphy. So I wonder if it's a different code because how do you disambiguate a, a dit from a da? It's the end of the can or the side of the can. Say that again? Oh, it had two different It's sounds. the end of the can or the side of the can. Oh. For dits and das. Oh, I had no idea. But usually it's because some of the inmates are veterans of say the Korean War and had to learn telegraphy to be radioman. 
or communications workers. So they teach it to the other inmates and uh, the uh, custodial personnel are never taught it and never bothered to learn. They just don't find it that valuable. But sometimes management will bring in a retired telegrapher when they think something's up <laughs> and they will listen over the intercoms to the various uh, galleries of the prison and give none of the inmates can send faster than those retired telegraphers can receive. So unless they devise a code and most of them are easily broken to lay on top of their code, uh, it's, you know, they're being heard in the clear. So it's, it's not that uh, good a tool. Anybody got anything else? Go ahead, Will. Well, yeah, along those lines, Tom, and this has always uh, puzzled me. When I took my general exam a long time ago, the uh, examiner in New York City, uh, you know, once if you got through the receive part, that was the hard one, then, then you'd go to the send. They didn't want to waste time listening to somebody send if they were going to flunk out on receive. So uh, uh, th this old guy, I mean, he must have been, I don't know, 100 in the shade. And when I, when I did my sending, uh, it just went to a relay. You know, it was just a bunch of clicks. And he would be doing what he was doing at his desk and, and, and you know, say, oh, yep, you got it, you got it. Those are 10 words there. Um, and I always wondered how could he tell just from listening to the clicks, a dit from a da, when it's really the space after that that determines whether it was a dit or a da. And if it comes in the middle of a word, it's going to have a different spacing than if it comes at the end of a word. And I just, I just figured he's so used to it that he knows some combinations are, are possible and some of them just aren't English. But do you have any insight into that? That's always, always bothered me. Well, the, the clicking of a sounder, or in this case, a relay, um, and there were relays built specifically for use as uh, a combination of a relay and a sounder, but again, that's later developments beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, the clicking was a fast click, and it produces two clicks when you think about it, one when the magnet pulls it down, and then one when the magnet releases it. So you're pressing the key for a short time, is click, click, and that's a dip, and for a longer time, it's click, click, and that's a da. So... Wait. But but for like for three spaces, it'd be hard to tell whether that was a closure or an o closure of one or an opener or the other. There were three dits between each letter. The uh -huh. length of time of three dits, so they right. were set apart from each other. Uh huh. And there were um, five dits between each word. The spaces of five dits. So the rhythm of the thing is how people got used to doing it, and that was what was super valuable. Once you had the rhythm down. You could make a decent salary because, again, you were paid by the word. Uh, that came out in labor troubles later because of uh, advances in technology. And the company thought they should get all the advances, but they weren't buying the technology the telegraphers were. So there were strikes and struggles over that. And uh, eventually they came to an understanding that pay by the word was going to stay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. That's always, always bothered me. Thanks. Fred? Yeah, I was just going to comment. Uh, it was interesting uh, when you had the diagram of the different stations, um, and those may have been Western Union stations, they may have been railroad stations, but it is interesting that even to this day, uh, a lot of places on the railroad um, are, uh, have letter names. And um, it turns out that those letter names were, in fact, the call signs of um, the telegraphy station when that's what the railroad was using was telegraphy. And so, you know, and some of them, you know, like I know when I lived in the Harrisburg area, there was like uh, R Tower, which was the call sign R for Rutherford Yard. And, and um, there's a place up along the mountains going up between Altoona and um, uh the peak of the alleghenies uh was mg stood for mid-grade because it was roughly halfway between but those uh, call signs were still there and i remember taking you know train trips you can still see them on the towers when they still had towers and even now that the towers are gone um and they have like little bungalows that have all the electronic stuff that replaced them um they still seem to use those because i guess people have had them in their minds for 50 to 100 years 
Yeah, the, the, uh, that was brought about by the needs to print schedules as economically as possible. So instead of saying Rutherford, uh, they would print an abbreviation with a table in the front of the schedule so that you could read the schedule. But uh, neophytes to reading railway schedules were always flipping back and forth between, you could tell a new person on railways from, from a more experienced riders by how many times they flipped back and forth to the, to the uh, code at the front. Um, and uh, there were all sorts of things that went with that, but uh, it would take a little time to roll them out. And I don't think we necessarily want to get into that much, get into it that much. So that's the, uh, unless somebody has another question. Sorry about that. Unless somebody has another question, uh, that's what I have. Now I can do if there's a, a desire for it, a more extensive presentation building on these basics of the later developments in telegraphy. And some of them were pretty darn wonderful. Uh, quadruplex transmissions, which was developed by Edison. You know, everybody says, well, his electricity didn't get adopted. He has a lot more uh, inventions to his credit than direct current electricity. Uh, and people don't seem to realize that. Uh, but he could be a mean son of a gun. Uh, and uh, he and Westinghouse fell out. Now Westinghouse made his money on, what was it, Fred, you should know. Air brakes. Air brakes. That made Westinghouse a, a rich man because once air brakes were developed, you could stop and start a train smoothly. Before air brakes were developed, brakemen literally ran across the tops of the cars, turning the wheels that stuck up three or more feet above the end of the car to tighten or loosen the brakes to keep the speed under control or to bring it to a stop or let it proceed. And it wasn't a gentle and smooth procedure. It enveloped a lot of jerks and uh, rough starts and very unpleasant for the people. So. When Westinghouse came up with air brakes, uh, he made his fortune later. Uh, and he and he and uh, Edison were, were good friends up until the electricity battles. Uh, and Westinghouse decided to put his money behind Tesla. And he and Edison never spoke a, a Westinghouse and Edison never spoke a, a good word to each other from that moment on. Uh, Edison arranged to electrocute animals at public displays using Tesla's uh, alternating current as a demonstration of how dangerous it was. And he, he got so uh, mean about it, he would execute elephants using AC current at large fairs and things like that, um, trying to convince people. So my tagline on a lot of my emails, especially when I'm uh, corresponding with people in electrical work says, this alternating current is just a fad. It is much too dangerous for general use. And then it says, Thomas Alva Edison, <laughs> you know, to show how wrong one person can be. And I haven't figured out a way to beat him yet on being that wrong. So I hope to never. Any other questions or anything or? I guess not. So back to you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. What a great presentation. You know, it's always nice to, to get a feel for where we came from, the early days. And definitely we have to have you back to continue this whole discussion. It's just, it's fascinating. So thank you again. Um, all right. So anything more before we close for the night? Yeah, I'd like to contribute a very small segue to the next presentation. So this gentleman, gentleman, Guillermo Marconi, worked for the British Post Office and Telegraph. He was vacationing uh, in Switzerland and picked up an electricity magazine. And in the back, there was a, uh, an obituary on Heinrich Hertz, or Hertzer. And he was a professor that demonstrated there was some kind of a spark out affair with a coil, and he was able to generate a spark out of distance. And he said it had no practical application, but it was of scientific interest. So Marconi took two disparate ideas, radio and telegraph, and created radio telegraphy. So there you go.
Great. Well, thank you. <laughs> we have so many, many smart people here. Great insights. For many decades, um, the radio operators on ships around the world were employees of the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company. You could not operate his patented devices unless you were an employee of the company. So, for instance, on the Titanic, the two telegraphers on the Titanic were Marconi employees. Um, they were not White Star Line employees. Just an interesting factoid. Marconi tried to give his invention, he was an Italian by birth, to the Italian Navy. And they basically threw him out as a, a peddler of gimmicks. The British were not so dumb about it. So they had the first lock on military uh, battle telegraphy at sea, made of tremendous change in the outcome of naval battles because command and control was overwhelmingly signified, simplified. Okay. No longer would a pennant flag say, England expects every man will do his duty. That was a string of telegraphy much shorter than I could speak it. 